All right, good morning, everybody. It's now 11 o'clock. We're going to get started with our webinar. I am Mike Tarosha with Schmerzel, and we appreciate your time this morning. We got a lot of information to cover in a short amount of time. At this time, we're going to cover everything in about 45 minutes. During the webinar, if you do have any questions, please feel free to type those questions in there. We'll get to as many questions as possible at the end of the session. And what we do not cover, we'll definitely get back to you on a one-on-one -on -one basis to make sure your questions are answered. But at this time, I'd like to introduce Eric Kummer with the CSI, excuse me, CSIA. Eric, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Mike. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Kummer, and with me is Bob Lowe. And uh, he's the executive director of CSIA. Now, uh, first, I wanted to thank everyone to, uh, for signing on and to say that CSA is pleased to co-sponsor this educational webinar with Smersal, a CSA partner member. Now, this is part of an ongoing partner webinar series, so to learn more, visit www.controlsys.org, uh, where, you, where you'll be able to find a record of today's uh, webinar and learn more about uh, upcoming webinars. Um, now, we are grateful for Schmerzl's support of CSI, particularly in providing this technical education presentation to the system integration and end-user community. Now, the, for those of you who are unfamiliar with CSI, we are the only trade association focused on advancing the system integration industry. Now, our vision is to ensure that manufacturing and process industries everywhere have access to low-risk, safe, and successful application of automation technology. Now to accomplish this, CSI supports system integrator companies in becoming better businesses. We offer guidance to improve your effectiveness with our best practices and benchmarks manual, an open forum to connect and learn from other companies, and opportunities to market within the industry. Now as you continue to improve your management skills, you can actually begin to work towards becoming CSI certified. It's an industry standard in business excellence. Now, CSI membership offers you access to the resources needed to accomplish this. These benefits include networking opportunities at the annual, annual executive conference, marketing toolkits, educational materials, and the industrial automation exchange. This is an online resource that connects system integrators, industry suppliers, and manufacturers and process companies together in one convenient location. Now these are just a few examples of how CSI can improve your business, with CSI certification being the recognized seal of approval. Now CSI certification demonstrates commitment to meeting the highest standards uh, for integrated business and management. Successful system integration businesses combine technical proficiency with sound business practices. Now, what does this mean to Smersal? Now, CSI certification focuses on business practices, whereas Smersal's training focuses on technical abilities and safety. Now, end user clients will recognize your commitment to industry standards and business acumen when they see that you are CSI certified. Certification also increases the probability of Smersal's products being well represented and greatly reduces the risk of project failure. Now, thanks again for attending. And I'd like to hand it back on over to Mike DeRosier with Mercer. All right, thank you, Eric. Again, welcome, everybody. If you have any questions, type into the questions field, and we'll get them to the best of our ability here. So what we're going to start off with, when we talk about machine guarding and understanding machine guarding, we have to look at the process. What is the process? And Many times it's a puzzle. It has to be put together as you see visualized here on this slide. You got to have all the pieces to have an effective machine safeguarding program. What you're going to start off with is your strategic planning. Without your plan, it's hard to move forward and you can miss steps, you can miss things, and you can have holes in guarding as a result. So we'll talk about the details of each one of these sections and what it really encompasses. But we have to start off with our strategic plan. What are we going to do? How are we going to do it? What resources are we using to do that and accomplish our machine safeguarding? The next steps for second or third kind of go hand in hand, the training and the risk assessment process. 
how do you know what to guard, how to guard, and what to do without going through your risk assessment? But in the same token, getting the training, whether it be machine guarding training, risk assessment training, safety training, how do you know what to put into place without having the background or the training to be able to do that? Same thing, you can end up with holes in your guarding and have exposed risks for personnel on equipment. So the training and the risk assessment kind of go hand in hand. One can come before the other or vice versa. Once you've done your risk assessment and you've got your training in place, you need to look at what the implementation plan would be. Meaning you have this list of hazards you identify or gaps that you have in your machine safeguarding program. What is going to be the process? How are you going to proceed? We know as much as we all like to see everything completely safeguarded instantly, it's not realistic, especially in larger facilities. What are the timelines? What are the expectations? What are the deadlines? How are you going to do it? What are the designs going to be? That's your implementation plan, followed by your actual integration. Who's doing the integration? Is it somebody internally? Is it an external integrator? Is it an OEM that built the equipment? What's being done? How's it being done? What is going to be the process of doing that to actually integrate your safety into your machine? Now, when we break those down, you can see in the slide, when we start with the strategic planning, what are the policies or the standards? What are the regulations? How are you going to proceed? Your risk assessment, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The identification, you're quantifying it, and you're putting a number to it so you can be able to prioritize and see where your risk factors really lie on your equipment or your facility. The training, who's getting trained and what type of training? If you have a team that's doing your audit, for example, what kind of training do they need? Is it controls, who's evaluating your schematics to ensure it meets the proper safety level? Mechanical, do you need a mechanical engineer to help you identify mechanical hazards? The implementation plan, as we just discussed, what are your next steps, what's the timeline? How do you evaluate your progress? How do you make sure things are getting done and staying on track, or how do you get them back on track? And then the integration, the design, the fab, installation, and so forth. When you look at the process, the next few slides I'm going to cover is probably some of the most common statements that you'll hear. Human nature kicks in a lot of times, and human nature is resistant to change, and we put up defensive walls. So some of the defensive walls that you tend to hear come from the operators or the maintenance of the engineer that are actually working on the machine, and they're not doing it intentionally to be difficult. A lot of times it becomes a comfort level, and you hear some of these statements that it'll never happen to me. If you're going to put guarding on here, you're going to make my job harder. You know, common sense tells me not to do that. I'm not going to stick my hand into a machine in order to get hurt as a result of putting my hand in there, knowing that something can happen. The problem with any of those statements is they're not true. It can happen. The goal is not to make the job harder. The goal is to try to provide a proper safeguard with still allowing you or the operator to do their job. As much as we'd all like to say common sense kicks in, reality is human nature is what kicks in, that sometimes we react without thinking about it. Common sense, if you were to stop and think about what's going to happen by your action of sticking your hand or your foot or your body into a machine, you may not do that. But when things happen on a line, a reaction is you are going to react to the machine and not see what's about to happen to you. You reach and grab when something goes wrong. Maintenance engineer, I need to bypass the guard to do my job. So you got to raise the question, why do you need to bypass guarding? 
does it really need to be bypassed? Is it a convenience factor or is there a functionality factor to it? You really need to get down to the, the root cause and the root reason of why guards are being bypassed because that should be minimized if avoided completely. Safety press professionals making the statement the machine must be guarded. Well, if the machine must be guarded, sometimes safety professionals may not have an understanding of how the machine actually works. What are the ins and outs? What are the functionality? Just putting a box around it is not the solution. You know, management saying this will shut us down or we'll lose money because it's going to slow production down. That means you may not have a great solution. So one of the first things you got to do is go through the different quotes that you see and put a little reality to it and find out what is the root cause. When you look at a productivity standpoint, the machine is going to run slower due to the steps needed. A lot of times operators are so used to not having the guarding in place, they don't have the impedance, and they're doing things. You know, I cannot work with the machine in the same way. Well, the idea is to keep their body parts and their body themselves safe. We want people to go home at the end of the day with all their digits safe to their families, to their loved ones, to do what they need to do, not to have a life-changing type of event because of what could happen on a machine. So the goal is not to make them run slower. The reality is you may start guarding things and find out the intervention that an operator is providing must be the fact of the machine may not be running right to begin with and the operator has been masking those situations because of their intervention. Maybe it's a fix or a worn part on the machine that they need so much intervention that can be corrected. Machine safety upgrades cost money. Doing modifications cost too much money. Uh, when you weigh out the cost of an injury, it is hard to argue that thing, but let's face it, it does cost money to upgrade an existing machine. It's much more cost effective to do it in the design phases. But there's a lot of machines out there that were never designed with safety in mind. There was many safety standards that we have today that you look at up to, but it does cost money. And safety upgrades cost more than what the machine is worth. You have to lay out the cost factor in regards to the machine. Is it worth buying a new machine? You don't want to make the choice of not spending money on a machine to properly safeguard that machine as a result of an injury. So all it takes is that one injury and it could cost a whole lot more money as a result. Finding the right solution. The argument, that will never work. I don't know now what the standard is telling me. We cannot guard the machine. You have to guard the machine. Finding the balance. When you look at these different solutions. Sometimes people can get very stubborn and set in their ways as we talked about with human nature and that resistive to change that you almost have a set of blinders on because you have a certain path down there. You have to open up the vision a little bit more to see what will work. You know, the fact that that will never work, you're already closed minded. You have to open up and understand what's going on to come up with a very good solution that will work for operation as well as safety. Yeah, I don't know what the standard is telling me. Well, that's very difficult. A lot of standards trying to take it from words and actually implement it onto a machine is not the easiest thing to do. You have some interpretation factors up to it. But bottom line is you can still get through some of those standards to improve the overall safety of the machine, and we'll talk a little bit about standards. The balance. We cannot guard the machine. You have to guard the machine. You know, this is the typical debate, whether you're talking between an end user and an OEM or integrator, or just within a facility, the EHS department versus the operators on the floor. You get that uh, butting of heads, and people do not agree. And a lot of times, it's the communication. It's the understanding of what needs to be done 
but how does it need to be done? You know, we cannot guard the machine. Well, if you guard the machine, you're going to impede our work. That's the understanding. Or safety says you have to guard the machine, but they may not understand how the machine works. If you can get both parties on the same communication path, have EHS explain why does the machine need to be guarded, what are the reasons behind it, but on the same token, have operation explain how does this machine really run so EHS has a better understanding of how they can help come up with a solution that's going to work for production at the same time. So break down the barriers for the communication, get on the same page, make sure people understand what is going on with the machine, how does it really work, how does production work with it, what do we need to do to put the proper machine safety upgrades into place. Now when we look at strategic plans, looking at the policies and standards, one of the first things are, is there any current company standards or policies in place? Naturally, for any of us that are in the U.S., OSHA is our governing body, but we know the OSHA standards for machine guarding can be very vague at times that we have to rely on voluntary industry consensus standards, such as ANSI, ISO, IEC, for example, uh, just to name a few. When we look at our governing body, our governing body being OSHA does recommend that we use industry consensus standards as they're going to be more up-to-date than what OSHA is, but no industry standard will override an existing OSHA standard. You cannot take it to a lower safety level than what OSHA dictates. That's pretty much the, the way it works. There you can see a couple of the generic standards that people would follow in regards to machine safeguarding. When you look at safety standards, safety standards are divided into types, type A, B, and C. A are basic standards, like ISO 12100. It's general aspects. It's not specific to a machine or a group type or group types of machines. ISO 12100 is the general principles for machine guarding and risk analysis. B standards refer more to a specific group such as ISO 13849 for industrial controls, performance level, and FPA 79 industrial controls for machines, for example. It's not specific to machines, it's specific to controls. So it's a group as an example. Type C are specific to a machine or machinery group. The ANSI RIA 15.06, for example, is the standard for robots and robot cells. That standard is specific to robot to robot cells. There's other functions with robots that are not in a general basis, such as teaching a robot and speed requirements and the type of pen that you need or required to have to perform that teach function. That's specific to robot and robot cells. Type C standards will always take precedence over B or A, but what I always tell people is B or A are always complementary to whatever you're doing to a specific industry or industry type, and the Type C will pull from the A and B standards as well. Some ex specific examples when we're talking machine standards, OSHA, for example, 1910.212 is the general requirements for machines in regard to OSHA. 1910.212 Section A1, for example, talks about types of guarding. And one or more methods of machine guarding shall be provided to protect operators and other employees. The reason I bolded this statement is one of the common misunderstandings out there is OSHA's goal is to tell everybody that they have to box everything in so you can't get to it. And that's not true. They're not saying you have to box it. It could be a hard guarding solution. It could be a light curtain, a safety mat, a two-hand control. There are different technologies out there that provide guarding as long as it's installed properly, which is what we get to Section A3, Subsection 2. 
The point of operation machines whose operation is supposed to employ the injury shall be guarded. The guarding device shall be in conformity with any appropriate standard. Basically, when you're putting guarding up and you're designing guarding and you're putting safety switches or you're putting light curtains, you want to make sure you're using devices that are conforming to a specific standard related around those devices or those guard types. When we look at some of the type B and type C standards, when we look at uh, one of the most common things being um, the ANSI B11.19 standard, for example, what we're referring to when we talk about these different standards, you can see my bullet at the bottom, guard cell use hardware that requires a tool that is not common to an operator. We'll get into questions, well, if it requires a tool, just because it's common to an operator, is that not considered willful intent? Unfortunately, it's not, because an operator could be tempted to defeat a guard to fix something to try to help production. Should they be doing it? No. You can see listed in B11.19, unauthorized adjustment or circumventions, tools that are necessary for adjustment or removal. Some of those types of transfers should be used are, and they talk about some of the different types. 14.120 from ISO, removal only by a tool, use of a tool by an authorized person. You can even see in manufacturer's installation instructions, you know, here is a, an excerpt from an installation instruction. Safety sensor and actuator must be permanently fitted to the safeguards, protecting against displacement by suitable measures, whether they be tamper-proof screws, gluing, so forth. Another common one is reclosing of a guard, allowing the machine to automatically start back up. Just by closing the door, allowing the machine just to start going again. You can see with B11.19, NFPA 79, and EN60204, those bolded statements, reclosing the interlock guard shall not in and of itself cause a hazardous situation. Same statement for NFPA 79, same statement for 60204. Basically, it's saying that you have to reset or re-enable the safety system to allow it to start, but it doesn't actually start any motion on its own. How do you design an effective guarding solution without a risk analysis? A lot of standards are now calling out some sort of risk assessment or hazard analysis for the machine. It sounds funny, but a lot of times this step is missed, and that's one of the critical steps. We talked in the five puzzle pieces when we started the presentation that you need to have. How do you know what needs to be done? Where is the risk factors? How do you know something does need to be done until you do a hazard analysis, whether it's a job hazard analysis, a risk assessment on the machine? You see the different standards calling out. How do you reduce the risk on the machine? It comes back to performing a risk analysis or a risk assessment on the machine. Proper safeguarding does not stop with the device and needs to have full safety integration with the control system. For example, safety monitoring relays or controllers. Controllers with NFPA 79, for example, providing complete or redundancy or diversity. ISO 13849 calls out the single fault in any of these parts and that leads to the loss of the safety function for control category three. By putting the proper safety devices on is definitely a step in the right direction. However, with doing that, you don't stop at the device. You have to look at what's going on behind the scenes, which is completely invisible to the operator. How do you prevent a machine from restarting up upon a failure of the control system through redundancy monitoring, safety monitoring relays, safety PLCs. That stuff is all invisible. It's all behind the scenes. All an operator sees is the device on the door. They open up the door. The machine shuts down as a result. This list here is probably the most common comprehensive list. When we talk ISO, we're talking global 
and we're talking harmonization. Even in the U.S., a lot of the ANSI and NFPA are referring back to ISO standards. Some of the representation from ANSI sits on some of these ISO committees. We're getting closer to the global harmonization, and these are probably the most common type A, type B standard to use as a resource, 13849 for performance levels for control systems, ISO 12100 for the risk assessment principles with the technical report that goes along with it, 14121. 14120 is the general standard for guarding requirements. 13855 and 857 have to deal with minimum safe distance and positioning of those safeguards. How far away does the guard have to be based off of opening size or the light curtain based off its resolution and your reaching capability or two-hand controls? 13851 for two-hand controls, 854 for gaps for avoid crossing, and the latest one being ISO 14119 dealing with interlocking devices on guards. What are the types? What are the measures? How do you matter? What should you be doing? Part of that strategic plan, we look at these lists of questions. What are the risk assessment methodology you're going to be used? You want to make sure it's consistent. What's your timeline of getting these things done? What documentation do you have? What do you need? How are you going to do it? Is it all internal? Is it external? Is it a combination of the two? What resources are you going to have to perform it? What's your plan for moving forward to finish it off? You don't want to go through this step and then just stop right where you're at. What standards are you going to apply? What's your machine safeguarding team? And I emphasize team. It can't be one person that handles your whole facility, for example, or a facility. Now we're going to talk about risk assessment, where we're going to identify, quantify, and prioritize. Basically, what you're looking at, you're looking at some of the different aspects here that you see listed. What are the limits of the machinery? What are your types of hazards? Can you look and see reasonable or foreseeable misuse, meaning do you know somebody's going to be tempted to override something or do something they're not supposed to that you need to safeguard from? Do you know what access areas? Is there loading or unloading stations? How do you effectively guard it or safely put the machine in an interlock condition? Current guarding. Is the current guarding adequate? You may go out and see that guards have been put into place, but there's holes in those guards, and people are reaching around through those guards and getting into hazardous situations. Do you have all the proper documentation to perform an effective risk analysis? Where are the gaps, where are the holes with schematics or your lockout tagout procedures or policies? Do you have SOPs written for the machine and so forth? Now you see here representation. I don't care whether it's the addition method you see on the right or it's a multiplication method. They're probably two of the most common ways of doing it by looking at severity of harm, frequency of exposure, possibility of avoiding it, and the number of people. It doesn't matter which method you use. Just make sure you're consistent throughout that facility that you get the same numbers so you can prioritize accordingly. Don't do half the floor with one method and the other half the floor with another method. Follow one method through the entire facility. That way you have true numbers to compare from hazard to hazard. Now prioritize. As much as we want to see all hazards taken care of. Reality is, we said it earlier, it can't happen overnight. It takes time to do this. So where are your highest risks are based off of the risk analysis? If you have 100 machines on your plant floor and out of those 100 machines, let's say you generated 1,000 line items of hazards, well, where are the priorities? You may find that out of the 100 machines, these five machines expose the company to the most hazardous situation. It doesn't mean that nobody can not get hurt on other machines, but their highest and most likely risk factors are with these particular five. They're going to be the first five that are going to be worked on as a result to reduce the risk throughout the facility. But you start developing that game plan based off of your risk assessment. 
knowing where your priorities are, what needs to be done, what is your game plan, what do you have to work on, where is your greatest exposure. The training, we mentioned this, what kind of training do you need? Is it general machine guarding? Is it specific to a standard like ISO 13849? Do you need training on safety products? So who's being trained? Is it a team of people where it's a mix of EHS, operators, engineers? What type of training is really required so you can have an effective machine safeguarding program? The personnel to be trained, the thing that you want to look at is what are your guarding types. Learn about the different types. Where here you see pictures of fixed and movable guards. Well, what makes those guards? Is it the fasteners that goes on there? Do you have the proper safety distance, like we mentioned with ISO 13857, for example? And then when you have movable guards, what kind of devices are you going to put on there? There are a couple of different types. Safety rated limit switches, for example. Look at the design standards, such as 947-5-1 for positive break of those types of devices. Heat interlock switches having a separate key that mounts to the door where the switch is mounted to the frame of the machine, knowing that the guard door is closed. Having safety switches designed into the hinge pins, for example, or the hinge is integrated with the switch body itself. Well, you notice these three types all are meeting EN60947-5-1, which is positive break. We mentioned earlier, OSHA says any devices you use, make sure they're in conformance with the appropriate standards. That's what you're looking for in safety devices. Locking switches are another type. You use locking switches for two different reasons. One is protection of men, meaning that there's residual motion or residual energy that it takes time to dissipate. You have to come to a safe stop before you allow the door to open. Another application is using it for process control, where you don't want people just opening up the door in the middle of a process. You keep that door locked and safely closed until the process is finished. Then you get into non-contact, whether they be coded magnetic or electronic types, they're proximity types. So they're not actual positive break, which is why you see the standard change from a dash 5 dash 1 to a dash 5 dash 3. And that dash 5 dash 3 deals with proximity type of safety devices, such as the ones you see there. The last type for doors would be a key exchange type of system, where you have the wiring at the main panel, and you have a mechanical lock system through an exchange of trapped keys. Not forgetting about what we refer to as non-separating guarding, you have your e-stops, making sure your machine has all the proper e-stops and the right number of e-stops required for that machine. Do you need other measures such as safety mats, edges and bumpers, for example, automated doors, for example? What do you need to do there? Optical type of devices, being single beam for body protection or light curtains or light grids for being able to stop somebody from reaching in through infrared light. It's also devices called laser scanners that scan the field similar to a safety map. These are all different devices that you can use for different applications on a machine. Two-hand control. Bounding two hands for operation has to be anti-tie down so you don't tie one switch down and the other. They have to be tripped within 500 milliseconds of one another. That's laid out in ISO 13851. Enabling devices, two or three position, yet I prefer three position so it's a little harder to, to bypass and tape down to allow a certain function of machine such as a limited jog or limited speed for setup, for example then the controls that go behind it, your safety monitoring relays, your safety PLCs, knowing what they are, what they're doing, how they actually function, and what's the uh, difference on the impact on the safety of the machine. When we look at safety monitoring relays, and you see this listed under training, it's because of understanding safety service. 
safety monitoring relays or safety PLCs are often thought of as black magic. Nobody knows what's going on inside those little black boxes. They just know that they see lights blinking on and off. If your maintenance personnel is not trained on how a safety relay or that safety circuit works, how do you expect them to effectively troubleshoot it? A lot of times you'll see, unfortunately, it get jumpered out because they got to get production going and the safety system is completely bypassed. They didn't know what was going on. Many times it's not the safety controller that is actually defective. It did its job. It found a fault somewhere, whether it was a short circuit of wiring or a switch failure or a contactor failure. It did what it was supposed to do. Now, again, this is all invisible. It's behind the scenes. It's in a control box, knowing the redundancy and knowing the wiring, but it's also knowing how to properly and effectively troubleshoot these safety circuits to have an effective safety system. Now we run into the implementation plan. We've gone through our risk assessment. We've gone through our training. We know what types of devices that are on there. So what are our next steps at this point? We have to develop a plan. What is that plan? We look at our risk assessment. We look at our priorities. We develop a timeline. But with doing that, you can now look at a scope of supply. Based off of the hazards found, what needs to be done to effectively guard this? Do you understand how that machine works? Do you understand how operators work with the machine? Is it being run properly? you can now develop a plan on how to effectively design, build, and install guarding on a machine. I'll bring up that example of having 100 machines in a facility. And the first, uh, the top five machines for priorities, let's say they're five of the same exact machine. Even though they're the highest on the priority, what you want to do is make sure you are looking at one initially, implement a solution, and make sure that solution works before you implement on all the other ones because it's easier to make a change on one and then replicate what needs to be done versus making changes on all five and shutting the machines down because of them not being an effective guard and become more of a penis and create an even greater hazard. You want to prove the concepts out. Understand what the costs are going to be. How long does the equipment need to be down? We know production is critical. People need to produce in order to make money. If a machine is not making money, or excuse me, producing, the company is not making money. What are the expected downtimes? Does the machine need to be down for two days, three days, a week, a half a day? What needs to be done to build up that production as to not impact the profitability of the company. What is the scheduled downtime required? Is it during a factory shutdown that you can get to this machine? You don't want to find these things out after the fact and when you start the process. That's why you want that implementation plan lay out for each machine what needs to be done and what your timeline is going to be and what your expectations are. And then the last step comes down to the integration side. What are the designs? What are you doing? Are you using separating guarding or are you using non-separate guarding meeting? Are you using fixed barrier guards? Or are you using something like a white curtain to create that guarding concept? What is appropriate for that particular machine and that particular function? What devices are you going to use if you're using guard doors? What type of switches are you going to be using? How are you implementing it to the controls? I've seen cases where changes were made where guarding was added, guarding was changed, guarding was modified, and they'll put a proper safety switch on there, but then they run the switches to the same exact controls of the system. If they improve the reliability of the guard and the switch from failing or easily bypassed, but when you've determined that your machine is a high-risk, high-hazard amputation type of machine and you don't put the redundancy and monitoring back in the controls, your weak link becomes the control system. You want to take the guarding from front to back, not just take what is visual. So understand what needs to be done, what's being implemented, what is the impact, 
and have you significantly reduced the risk? So in your design phases, what is the guarding proposal? Do you know what's going to be reviewed, uh, excuse me, going to be built? Did you review the schematic changes? Do you have a controls engineer understanding what's being done to the schematic to know that it's being done the right way? As the end user or the integrator, who's approving the concepts up? Under the fabrication, what's being fabricated and how? Do you know what materials is being used? Is it stainless steel? Is it welding? Is it extrusion? Is it fasteners? What's being used and does it meet the proper expectations for hardware and being tamper resistant? Understand the needs for installation. You may not have the resources. The integrator may need additional resources. It may be a combination of the two. Do you know how long it will take? Is there any contractor training required as a facility, for example? What else is needed? What additional resources? We talked about downtime, for example. And then the last step would be the validation, meaning when you install it, Part of what you see in the latest standards, such as ISO 13849, is to properly validate the system. Introduce the faults that the safety circuit is designed to detect and function with. So if you design a control reliable system or a category three system, you have redundancy in monitoring. You have a safety monitoring relation there. Can you put a short circuit on channel one of the switch? Will the machine still shut down? Can you prevent it from restarting? Same thing on channel two, short circuits, open circuits. Actually introduce the faults to prove that what you did is fully functional based off of the design. Opening up a door after everything's done and seeing the machine shut down does not prove that the safety, excuse me, safety function is working. It just proved that the machine is working when it needed to. It didn't prove that it worked upon any of the fault conditions. It was designed to detect. Make sure you have the proper documentation. When we say redo the assessment, meaning go through that hazard list. Did you take care of those hazards? And then did the changes to the machine create any new hazards that you were not aware of? I know I flew through a whole lot of information. And uh, I know there's going to be some questions uh, now and after the fact. So at this point, uh, Eric, if you want to unmute yourself, and I'll open up the questions field to see what we have and see if we can answer any questions for everybody. Sounds great. All right, so bear with me here, everybody, as I open up the questions field. Okay. All right, first one, uh, I'm going to read everything verbatim here. So all the reasons for not using guards seem to be mostly related to company safety culture. And unless the culture has changed, all the objections to using guards will persist. I completely agree with the statement. There's definitely something related to culture. And part of that culture does deal with human nature. And if the culture has been running that way for the last 20, 30 years, it could be hard to change culture because you have to change human nature. But if you get to a common ground of understanding, you definitely have to look at how a machine's run and come up with a solution that works. Now, there are going to be times where you completely butt heads and a person will not change their culture. And you need to have management buy into what proper guarding and proper operation of the machine is in order for your culture to change. If your management doesn't buy in, you're going to have a hard time changing culture and put an effective safety program for machine safeguarding in place. Uh, looks like I got a couple, just a couple comments that I was a little muffled. I apologize. I hope uh, everybody got everything there. Uh, do you know an easy-to-use, low-cost risk assessment software to help with all machines? 
I don't know of a, any type of low-cost software. I know I've seen software come out over the, the last couple of years. I know of a, a company that's coming out with a new one uh, very soon that seems to be a very good software package. But at the end of the day, a lot of people are looking for a software, which is great for printing out the nice reports for you. But there's nothing wrong with creating a risk assessment tool in Excel. There's no uh, dictation by standard that says you have to follow this particular methodology from things that I have seen or have experienced. You can definitely create your own tool and using something like ISO 12100, these are the different hazard types and they give you an example of all the different hazard types and utilize that in evaluating machine safety and do it via Excel. Okay, next one says NC standards change pretty frequently. How do you recommend keeping a whole corporation full of machines current with latest changes? I guess I can say that that is very, very, very difficult to do. Uh, ANSI standards typically, and not all the time, from what I've seen change every three to five years they get updated. For the most part, a lot of times the updates are there to incorporate modern technology. Sometimes it is function as machine types tend to advance. It's difficult to stay on top of all the changes for all machines. But if you focus in on the, the core type A and type B standards with the ISO and, and ANSI, for the most part, you'll see that you're going to be in compliance or close to compliance. And any of the changes, hopefully, would be minor changes because you have an effective machine safeguarding program implemented as it is by following those current standards. So I hope I answered that well enough. I know it's uh, a lot of times it's not always black and white. So if you need more clarification, definitely uh, let us know. Uh, let's see, next one. OSHA regulation 1910.147, which is the lockout tagout standard for OSHA, uh, states that lockout is not required when the activity is routine and integral to production and personnel are protected by other guarding methods. Does this mean I can have a light curtain by my be my safeguard when doing a die change on a press? The with 1910.147, there is a, a distinct line between application of lockout tagout and normal routine operator task. Die changes are not necessarily, even though you may consider them routine. It really depends on the design of the machine and the interlocking condition and the controls behind it that you would need to prove to OSHA that it is a normal routine operator test and the safeguarding is providing just as an effective means as doing lockout tagout, for example. Now with die block changes, that gets a little hard because you're actually, depending on the size, of the, the press, you could be climbing into the machine. You need to put uh, blocking mechanisms into place so gravity doesn't take over even under a lockout tagout condition. It's not a, a simple answer to say that all presses and all die changes would qualify by using a light curtain or a hard guard. It really depends on the machine, the company, and what is classified and considered to be normal routine task that would not qualify under 1910.147. However, in any of the things that I've seen or discussions I've had, doing die changes does get a little hard to justify not doing lockout tag out. However, I understand the flip side of that because you have to lower, you have to raise, you have to unfold. It depends on what you can classify and justify as being normal routine type of task at that point. 
All right, uh, next one, what's the difference between job hazard analysis and a risk assessment? There's not a whole lot of difference aside from sometimes methodology. A job hazard analysis looks more at each task that an operator does. You're analyzing that particular task or job that they're doing and identifying the risk factors related around that particular job or task where a risk assessment is kind of doing the same thing, it's just looked at, at a little bit differently and maybe a higher view than specific tasks where it's looking at more functions of the machine and the capability of, of reaching it. So I want to say it's a little bit more generic where a hazard analysis gets down to the nitty gritty of the work that's actually being performed by the operator or maintenance on that particular machine. Okay, next one, how do you determine what level of safety device is required for your application? Isn't there performance standards that must be met? What it comes down to, it comes down to the risk assessment. When you go to, through your risk assessment, it's not just identifying the hazard, it's determining what level of safety is really required. So following ISO 13849, for example, you'll see a decision tree of severity, frequency, and avoidance for each specific safety function. And that'll tell you, based off of that decision tree, what performance level is required for that specific safety function, and you work on achieving the performance level for that function. But when you walk up to a machine, you're not looking at what is existingly on the machine, but what needs to be, and then you can evaluate does the machine be what your risk assessment says it should be. So it's usually by the decision tree that tells you what your functions need to be and what safety level, and then you can take it from there. Uh, the Schmerz will offer turnkey options regarding especially vintage manual machines. As a company, uh, speaking as a company, we don't offer turnkey solutions. We do partner up with uh, integrators in areas uh, such as some of the CSI uh, A integrators that will put in touch with a customer to help people out on upgrades and help supply the components and the controls to complete that safeguarding. Uh, let's see, at what point does feasibility come into play? Can every machine be guarded in somehow, some fashion? When is it acceptable to say the guard implementation is unfeasible? Another, another great answer. I wish I had uh, some black and white, but unfortunately guarding is not black and white. There is a, a lot of gray, and it's getting down to an acceptable level of risk. So when you look at your guarding, when somebody right off the bat says, you cannot guard this machine, it's, it's not feasible, a lot of times I see that as a challenge because reality is at some point, somehow you can put some type of guarding on a machine to reduce your risk. It may not eliminate your risk, but you can certainly reduce your risk and follow up with the additional measures with SOPs, procedures, and training on safe operating practices or safe work procedures on that piece of equipment and use the combination of the two because you can guard machines. It may not be perfect. You may not be able to box it in, but you can most certainly reduce risk on a machine to say, okay, this is what we can do, and maybe you have to wait for more technology to come out to accommodate that specific machine type. Uh, this tends to be a question that comes up with much older pieces of equipment that were not designed with safety in mind to begin with. But there are different forms of safeguarding that you can put in the place that would help out. The uh, best way to guard laser welders, 
Um, I'm going to refer that back to the, the last one. It really depends on how it's being used, what's being done. could be a couple different methodologies to doing that. And uh, whoever asks this question, we can take this conversation more offline about your specific example to see if we can help out. Okay, the next one, if you upgrade a single machine as part of a new modification, are you then obligated to go back and update guarding on all the machines of the same type, even if they are not being modified? This is, when you look at the regulations, ANSI for example, a lot of the ANSI standards, you'll see that any new machines need to conform with that standard from that point on. Any existing machines needs to be retrofitted and they'll give you a timeline of 24 to 36 months on average to update. Reality is OSHA may not regulate to say, well, you upgraded this one and not that one. They'll come in when somebody gets hurt as a result. It's the litigation in the U.S. that comes down that you knew of better principles and practices to protect people from getting hurt on equipment. So if you modified a piece of equipment, and you have the same or similar other pieces of equipment that have the same hazards and you choose not to upgrade it because that machine wasn't being modified, you're not going to win that in a lawsuit because you knew of better principles and practices. Those machines should be upgraded. There is no such thing as grandfathering when it comes to machine safeguarding. When you got better technology, better principles and practices, those machines should be brought up to date to make sure you're ensuring protection of people. Bottom line, it comes down to OSHA's general duty clause. When you look at the general duty clause in the OSHA Act, each employer shall furnish a workplace with machines that are free of recognized hazards that can be likely to cause serious harm or fatality. So you have to protect people from serious harm is what it comes down to at the bottom line. Uh, let's see. Uh, what are the basic standards that you would default to when the customer wants to implement safety but does not have specific safety standards to refer to? Uh, that would go back to the list of ISO standards that we listed. And uh, you'll be able to see that list again when the recording is posted. And there's a question around when that would be posted. Uh, that should be posted probably uh, within the, the next few days to a week. What's the best approach for guarding a machine that's meant for a single person operation but may have another operator in the cell for training purposes? Uh, very difficult to do. For one thing, uh, you have to look at what is the, the training procedure. If it's meant for a single person, why are they in the cell? And if you know that that happens on a regular basis, can you add additional safety measures that protects that operator or that trainer as well? Can you put a, a two-hand control in their station? Do they have to be in the cell at that particular time? I would look at the justification of having a second person in there when it was designed for one person and the type of training that you do. And unfortunately, we do have a few more questions, but we did hit our 12 o'clock time frame. So I'll definitely get to the questions of the people that we have not uh, gotten to. And I'll get back to you individually. If you have anything else, please feel free to type them in and let us know. Uh, Eric, do you have anything else to add? Um, not necessarily. Uh, thanks for everyone again for coming on in. Um, obviously we have uh, the CSI Executive Conference is coming up at the end of April. If you're not familiar with that, feel free to go online. Our, again, our website is www.controlsys.org. Um, otherwise, if you're not familiar with the exchange, uh, check it out at the www.csiexchange.com and make sure that you're online. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day. Appreciate your time. All right. Thank you.